In the last video, we studied individual risk models. Uh, today, we are going to learn collective risk models. Uh, this is the second type of risk models we will study in chapter three. Uh, mathematically, it's given by 3.2. So uh, it, it looks very, very similar to that in the individual risk model, right? The only difference is small n becomes capital N. Uh, what we do uh, is quickly analyze what, what it means, okay? So the collective risk model N is uh, the number of claims. So this is exactly the claim frequency we studied in chapter one. Okay, and Xi is the size of the ice claim. This is exactly the claim civility we studied in chapter two. So you see the name collective means we collect those policies that result in claims. So that is the meaning of this collective risk model. So we collect policies with claims. If a policy comes back clean, we simply discard it, okay? Uh, here we only care about those policies that result in claims. So uh, since X is the size of claim, uh, if I do a quick comparison with, with uh, uh, individual, Let's say here is individual versus collective. So here is small n, which is a constant. Here we have big N, which is a random variable. When we set up this model, we don't know how many claims we will get from a risk pool, right? Uh, because it's something in the future, right? There's no way you can fully cast um, accurately how many claims your company is going to uh, receive for the next uh, uh, covered period. So it's constant versus a random variable, right? In the individual risk model, at the beginning, you already know how many contracts you have sold, right? Small n is, is the number of policies you have underwritten is known to you at the beginning. Big n is the number of claims you will receive by the end of the covered period, okay? This is something you don't know at time zero, but small n is something we know at time zero. Here, xi is i's policy. So xi is the loss from the i's policy, which may be zero. So it's greater than or equal to zero. Here, xi is the i's claim, meaning xi is always bigger than zero, right? In the individual risk model, a policy is likely to uh, contribute nothing, right? The, the policy holder behaves wonderfully, there's no claim. So xi is equal to zero, it's, it's very possible. It's actually the most likely scenario among all. But uh, for the collective risk model, since you only collect the policies that with result in claims, right, then xi must be strictly greater than zero. If, it's, if, if a policy has zero claim, you will not collect that particular policy, right? It's, it's, it's in the discarded pool. You only collect those with claims. So that is the true understanding of collective risk model. Once you know that, then uh, everything else, it's, it's, it's well, a little bit more than trivial, let's say that. Uh, of course, we have a name, n is called the primary distribution, x is the secondary, uh, n is claim frequency, x is claim stability. Okay, uh, it, it, uh, it's, it's pretty much the same uh, compound model we studied from chapter one, uh, except now uh, the meaning is different. Right? So here we have a different uh, 
uh, insurance setup, insurance interpolation for S in 3.2, right? N is the number of uh, claims, uh, XI is the size of each claim. Uh, of course, we have the uh, default assumptions. All the XIs are IID. And uh, uh, the claim frequency is independent of all the uh, claim sizes, they are independent. So in all our studies, we will make these two assumptions, even I don't say it, okay? The same uh, for SLA questions. Even you don't see uh, the explicit words for these two assumptions, uh, you should assume they hold, right? This is a default setup. Uh, with that in mind, uh, this uh, we already know, right? Previously from, even from chapter one, uh, M is the MGF, moment generating function. Uh, for this, it is defined as, right? So that is the definition of moment generating function. Uh, this one-to-one -one correspondence between a random variable and, uh, and uh, its MGF. So if you know the uh, distribution of a, of a random variable, you can compute its MGF. Uh, in some cases, it, it, it may be infinity, okay? Uh, but if it's well-defined, you can go backwards. Given a well-defined moment generating function, there exists a unique distribution or a unique random variable with that MGF. So uh, this is a convenient way to prove, you know, uh, the distribution of S if you are able to compute the MGF and you can identify what kind of distribution it is. Uh, you can also use the probability generating function if, uh, uh, if, if all your X's take non-negative discrete values, right? Uh, this is quite uh, restricting because the size of the claim, it's, it can be really anything, right? It can be uh, $200, it can be $200 plus 25 cents, you know, it's, it's, it's unlikely to be a, a discrete values, right? So it's, it's pretty much anything uh, bigger than zero or less than some, some capped value. Uh, this is the uh, result for the PGF, uh, mean and the variance. This bullet point is, uh, it's, it's probably the most important thing among those formulas. Uh, you need to know the expectation formula and the, the variance formula. Right? Uh, again, those are from the uh, conditional expectation. So uh, for this, you condition on, on N, Right. So once you condition on n, you treat n as a constant. So once I know how many n I have, this becomes n times the expectation of x. Right. And then I go back to uh, to regard this n as a random variable again. Right. So basically, you know, I fix it first, and then I do the expectation for x. Then inside becomes a random variable of n, right? E of x is a constant. Constant times n is another random variable. So we can factor it out. You get E of n times E of x, right? Similarly, we have uh, uh, the, the symmetrical, you know, formula I, I talked about, right? So you can, you can get this result. Uh, a, a useful corollary is if this is possible, what do we know? We know the expectation equals the variance equals lambda. In this case, the variance of S equals, so since they are the same, I can set it out. Variance of X plus the square of your, uh, of your mean, then I get this is actually the second moment. Uh, sometimes this will save you a little time, okay? And uh, uh, that's because we, we, we like Poisson distributions. We have many, many wonderful properties with compound puzzle, which we studied in chapter one. Uh, if you forget, you can, you can go back to, uh, to read those results, okay? So basically nice thing is if SI is a compound puzzle, adding them together, you get another compound puzzle. 
and the intensity lambda is simply the summation of all previous intensities. Okay. Um, there are a few, like uh, here, you know, there are a few cases that uh, the compound distribution can be analytically derived. Uh, these are these are rare cases. Okay. Uh, we we already started from uh, the individual risk model that uh, once we know once we know expectation and variance, and once the number of claims is big enough, right, which is usually the case right, for, for insurance companies, they are, uh, they are hardly any small insurance companies. Right? Small insurance companies usually uh, won't be able to survive for a long time if, if the size of their business is, is really small. Uh, for, for big insurance companies, the, the number of claims obviously is, is enormous. So applying normal distribution or, or applying normal approximation, uh, usually it's, it's not that bad, right? From here, we know expectation and variance. And if we apply normal approximation, uh, we quickly get everything we want, right? Mean and variance define a unique normal distribution, right? Uh, but of course, occasionally, we, we, uh, we would like to know the exact distribution of S. Uh, here we have an example. So we have exponential for the claim size. Uh, we have geometric for the uh, number of claims. Then the compound follows a mixed distribution uh, with probability mass of theta at zero. Beyond zero is continuous piece. And uh, especially, this is, a, this is another exponential, uh, but with different parameter. Right? It, uh, uh, it's, it's, um, you, because theta is something between zero and one, so you can think the uh, the size. By the way, here is one over lambda is the mean, right? Now is one over lambda theta, so it actually goes up, right? So you have another exponential distribution with bigger mean, right? Uh, how how do we prove? So here we apply the concept of MGF. So if you have exponential. This is the MGF of exponential from chapter two. Uh, this is the MGF of a geometric from chapter one. Then because we assume independency, we directly get the MGF of the aggregate, right? And after some mathematical work, it's, it's not easy, okay? Uh, for, for instance, at this step, you don't know how to continue, right? Uh, but uh, of course, we already have the result. Uh, we are trying to get a, a get a MGF to match this result. Then we know uh, the direction we are trying to uh, work on, right? So uh, from here, you you, you can see uh, this is exactly the distribution we are trying to uh, prove, right? Uh, this is uh, so when you have MGF at zero, what is it? t to zero is one times the probability at zero. Right, so the constant part, the constant part, because this is one, right? The constant part gives you the, uh, the probability at zero. That's why we have a probability mass at zero. The next part is weighted uh, exponential distribution. That is because this is the exponential distribution, right? This is exponential lambda. So we can see this is exponential lambda times theta. Right, with a different parameter. So that's why the weighted <coughs> exponential. Uh, of course, you may wonder, uh, what if I don't know? Right? What if I only have this and uh, I'm trying to figure out the exact distribution of S? Here, you know, it's, it's somehow we are trying to prove or we are trying to show this result. This result is already given to us. Right? We know this is true. We just need to confirm. Uh, but what if we don't know? Right, I give you X and N, I ask you, what would be the distribution of S? Uh, then it's slightly more challenging, but uh, uh, it's, it's doable, okay? So I give you some quick um, scratch, sketch, and uh, uh, if you can understand, that's excellent. If not, that's fine, okay? SOA definitely won't test you this. Then we need to analyze the probability. So, uh, n is n is geometric, right? So which means it can be anything. 
okay? So when n is zero, obviously it's zero, right? And when n is not zero, then all my xi will be zero for all i, right? Of course, here I, I, I haven't conditioned on the value of big N yet, but I know no matter what value I get, all my x's must be zero, okay? Uh, this part is trivial because it's a, geom uh, it's a geometric series, right? If, if uh, again, you know, in our notation, uh, a geometric distribution models the number of failures before the first success. And your parameter is the success probability. If n equals zero, that means your very first try is a success. So the probability is theta. Uh, why everything else is zero? That is because we have, we have a continuous distribution, right? It's a, it's an exponential distribution. For a continuous distribution, the probability equal to something is always zero. So we already know the first part. That is easy, right? Uh, somehow more complicated part is, um, uh, is, is this. So let's say we condition on a particular value. Okay, so I claim uh, this is Okay, uh, you can try to, to, uh, to show um, why this is a gamma distribution. Okay, uh, there are many things you can do, right? You can, well, you can try to condition on the value of it uh, because, because, well, let's, let's, let's try analyze. Okay, uh, so here, uh, this is not zero. Okay, this is non-zero, and uh, uh, you need to uh, basically uh, study uh, the value for the value for uh, given given n. Uh, what would be the uh, distribution of it? Uh, I think for this part, you can somehow you know check. One way to do it is. Uh, uh, is by MGF, right? Uh, when once you condition on a particular number, that is something uh, you you know, right? Uh, that means what you do is um, you you raise the power to. So once you know, this is actually right. Once you condition on uh, the random variable n equals small n then you add up n exponential distributions. Uh, by the way, exponential is gamma one. So exponential distribution is the same in distribution as the gamma one, one over lambda. Okay, uh, that is why I know, right? If, one, if a single exponential is gamma one, one over lambda, and I add them up, what I do? I raise the power to the nth and then uh, it becomes n, okay? Uh, once I have this result, I, I, can, I can get uh, to anything I want uh, because then all I need to do is to condition on the value of it, right? Uh, I don't need to consider zero because once it's zero, uh, it is zero, right? So I study non-zero probability. So this is the uh, analysis part. Uh, obviously, it's, it's, it's not easy. Uh, that's why, you know, it's, it, 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 it will never be tested, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I believe uh, some of you might be able to actually uh, understand. Uh, Pioneer recursion. Uh, we studied this in chapter one. Okay, there there are several conditions. Uh, the two uh, most important ones are your primary distribution, which is n, must be a b zero. So we have four uh, four choices for a b zero. Uh, we have binomial. We have geometric. We have negative binomial, we have Poisson. If your primary distribution is one of those, it is a AB0 class. Uh, the next assumption is X should be discrete and non-negative. What if our X is continuous? Then we can apply the 
I think that's something we did in example 3.2, right? We can discretize a continuous random variable. So let's say we have x, which is continuous random variable. Okay, uh, we can approximate it by a discrete version, right? So let's let's use n values of it. So let's say uh, at a particular value. So let's 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 use uh, zero, one, two, all the way to n. So then we can what well, we can we can somehow uh, approximate this by less than x plus zero point five greater than zero point five. Uh, no. So obviously it's minus. Okay, uh, if you want, you can put equality. That, that doesn't matter, you know, x um, uh, here, here it's not x, right? here's x. Uh, x is a continuous random variable. So uh, either you add or with, you know, you, with or without equality is the same, right? Uh, it's a continuous random variable. Uh, once we know the distribution, uh, we should be able to calculate the uh, CDF of x, right? Then this is, uh, fx x plus 0 0.5 minus fx x minus 0 0.5, right? Uh, so uh, by by utilizing this technique, we can approximate a continuous distribution by its discrete version, right? Of course, we need to decide uh, uh, how many values we want to uh, go up to. Uh, uh, the Panya decursive formula, you know, right, from chapter one. So. Uh, again, this is more powerful and uh, easier for us. Uh, we know how to compute expectation and variance. If the mean number, right, because we don't know the actual number of claims, if the mean is, is big enough, we tend to think uh, the, the actual number of claims will also be big, right? And uh, in that case, we can apply the normal approximation. Again, this is the uh, uh, formula we have been using time, time again. Uh, here we have an example. Assume is a collective risk model. So n is Poisson, secondary is exponential. Again, uh, make sure uh, you know when you calculate the mean is one divided by the parameter. In, in our case, uh, for SOA, the parameter is the mean. So uh, this, this, this are easy, right? Then what we have, uh, we want to do the standardization. Uh, by the way, uh, here, you want to know the probability, uh, the CDF at 180. Uh, you see here, the added up by 0 0.5. Uh, this is an adjustment, a continuation, or somehow, you know, or just a simply call it adjustment. If you want to know the probability less than something, you go up by 0 0.5. Uh, if you want to know the probability that is beyond something, greater than something, what you do is uh, you use 99.5 minus the mean minus the standard deviation. See that? Uh, basically, you want to be safer. You want to include slightly more, right? You want to less than 180, and you actually use the 180.5. Uh, so you go slightly more generous, right? For the same reason, I want the probability to be bigger than 100, I go slightly more generous, okay? I go with everything greater than 99.5. So that's the adjustment. Uh, I will tell you if, if I want you to use the adjustment. Usually it's okay not to use. Uh, again, the, in, in practice, the, the difference is tiny. So there's no need to uh, focus too much on that. Uh, I think I will stop here for the collective and uh, we'll continue for the uh, coverage modification. Uh, that is the part uh, SOA usually tests you on. So uh, I will uh, probably use more, uh, try to get some examples to, to cover uh, 3.4. So let's stop here.